Come on now, who's excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? You can make a little noise. Yes. Man, we believe the Lord is in this place. We believe today if you've come expecting to hear a word from God, that God will speak to you. And we declare in this place that the Lord will speak to you, that He will just open your heart and your mind just for the next few moments. Because this is going to know that we know this. So many of us coming here with things already on our mind, already on our heart. What's going on next weekend? What's coming up with this week with work, family, Christmas, shopping, eating? Can I get an amen? Come on now, right? It's going to be good times. But listen, but just for the next few moments, what I ask, if you just open your mind, that you just ask the Lord to speak to you. So if you just bow your head, let's just pray together. Would you just ask right now, say, Lord, speak to me. Say, Lord, I want to hear you. Lord, what would you have me to do? Lord, what do you want to say to me this morning? And Father, we just want to say thank you so much for being in this place. Thank you so much for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us this year already. God, you know our hearts, you know our mind, you know what keeps us up at night, you know what makes us anxious, you know what makes us depressed, you know what brings us joy. And God, we just ask for the next few moments that you would just calm our hearts, that you would calm our minds. And God, do what only you can do, that's just open our eyes that we may see your son Jesus, that you would open our ears that we will hear your son Jesus speak to us. For it's in his name we ask and we pray. And everybody said, come on now. Amen, amen. You may be seated. Go ahead and tell the person beside you, say, I'm glad you're here today. Say, I'm glad you're here today. Look at your second choice on the other side. Say, I'm glad you're here too. Go ahead, tell them. Say, I'm glad you're here too. Tell them what service you're coming to this weekend. Tell them if you're coming to Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Go ahead and tell them which one you're coming to. Which one you're coming. If they say I'm not, say, yes, you are. You're coming with me. Go ahead, tell them. You're sitting beside them, right? Guys, it's so good to see you all. If you're visiting with us, if you're first time, welcome to Bear Life Church. We're so glad you're here. You came at the best Sunday ever. This is the best Sunday ever to be in the house of the Lord. And I believe that the Lord is going to share with you. Yes. Already got people expecting here, Adam. It's going to be a good day. Right? It's the best Sunday ever because if you're visiting with us, you're going to find out exactly just kind of who we are, what's our mission, and where we're heading. And, and what I want to share with you over the last, we, we finished a series called Mission 1010. I want to recap that just in a moment for everyone who's new or new, or visiting with us, and also for those of you who are, were here the last two weeks, but let's just face it and be honest, you've already forgot what I preached about, okay? So we're going to make sure that we're all on the same page, bring all this together as we end this series before we go into the Christmas uh, series coming up. It's going to be awesome. Don't want to miss it. Here's the, here's the reality. Every single church on the planet has the same mission. Every church in the city has the same mission. Every church in the United States, every church, you know, that's a Bible-believing church has the same mission. It doesn't matter what denomination you are, whether you're Baptist, you're Methodist, you're Holiness, you're Pentecostal, doesn't matter. We have all been given the same mission. Do you all know that, right? Let me just make sure everybody understands that denominations are man-made things. You know that, right? Shake your head this way. God didn't make that. God died is the big C church. Man made these different divisions and things. But at the end of the day, God gave every single church that believes in the Bible the same mission. And somewhere between when Jesus died and got up out of the grave until he ascended to the right hand of the Father, he got to the disciples together and he gave the church the mission. Here's the mission. We don't get to write it. It's the mission that God gave us. Here it is. It's found in Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and he told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven on earth. How in the world does Jesus have all the authority? Because when you die and get up out of the grave, I'm going with that dude. You know what I'm saying? I'm on his team, right? And he's been given all authority in heaven to do what? To give us this commission. He says, therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all that I commanded you, and I surely, this is an awesome promise, I will always be with you even to the end of the age. That is the mission that God has given every single church. It's called the Great Commission. It's not a suggestion. 
It's a mission. And we're going to make disciples. Now, what's a disciple? A disciple is someone who really just, it's a pupil. It learns about Jesus. We like to say we want to help you learn about Jesus, love like Jesus, and lead like Jesus. We're going to baptize them. It means to identify with the teachings of Christ. But when you hear this message preached, it's usually a mission Sunday, and we're sending out missionaries into the world, and, and you're sitting there going, I'm not a missionary. And the reality is, if you're a Christian, yes, you are. See, when you see the word go, you think we got to go to another country or go somewhere else. No, that word go means as you're going through life. So let me help you understand it. As I'm going through life as a stay-at-home mom, you're to make disciples. As I'm going through life as a banker, you're to make disciples. As I'm going through life as a student, you're to make disciples. As I'm going through life as a pipe fitter, a plumber, you name it, you are called to influence the people around you so they would know Jesus, follow Jesus, so they could ultimately experience what we believe is a better Life. Now, every single church carries this mission out differently. What works in Eastern Kentucky, y'all ain't going to work in Las Vegas. I can tell you that right now. It ain't going to work. Every church has a different strategy how they're going to carry out that mission. And this is good news. You ready for some good news? It takes different churches to connect with different people, and that's okay. It's okay that some churches are different. It's going to take different churches to connect with different types of people. But the reality is we've all been given the same mission, and that is to help people Follow Jesus, know Jesus, point them to Jesus, identify with Jesus, learn about Jesus. That is everyone, if you're a Christian, that's your mission. And he's, been, he's given it to every single one of us. Several years ago as a church, you know, we, we were sitting here praying, saying, God, okay, you know, we're four or five years old now, six years old. Help us understand who we are. You know, I mean, you guys don't know if you know this, we're just 10 years old as a church. I mean, we didn't even got chest hair yet. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're just still growing here. We're just trying to figure this thing out, and we believe that we've not even got started yet for what God has in front of us. And we begin to pray and say, God, who are we? What do we value as a team and as a church? And John 10.10 is one of our favorite, you know, verses in in, in the Bible. And in this passage, what we decided to do is we we read the Great Commission and and John 10.10, and we married those two verses. Jesus spoke both of those. We married those two verses together that we would come up with our own mission statement of this house, of this church. And John 10 says this. It says, a thief only comes to steal, or the thief only is there to steal, kill, and destroy. I don't know if you know this, but you have an enemy who wants to destroy you. Satan wants to destroy your marriage, your purity, your finances, your relationship, your parenting, your education, your mind, your emotions. He hates you. And all these problems that we have, it's not with flesh and blood. It's against the principalities. It's against the spiritual warfare that's all around us. But thanks be to God, Jesus says, but I've come. I came. So that you can have a real life, that you can have eternal life, that you can have more life, that you can have a better life than you've ever dreamed of. Folks, let me tell you something about people. People are looking for something better. Everyone's looking for something better, right? Your marriage could be good, but you want it to be better. People want a better marriage. They want to be better financially. They want to be better in their parenting. They want to be better in sports. They want to be better in their academics, right? You want to be the best you can at your job. Everyone's looking for something better. Better. Well, we have the answer that makes our life better, and that is Jesus. And so what we've done as a church, we took the great commission that God's given us, and we took what Jesus says in John 10.10, and we put them together to come up with this statement for this house. This is our mission statement. I want you to see this. Our mission is to help people follow Jesus so they can experience a better life. Now, let, 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 let's welcome to class, kids. Let, can we all repeat this together? Come on, let's all say this together. Here we go. Ready? Here we go. Our mission is to help people follow Jesus so they can experience a better life. We're going to say this so much, you're going to sit there going, is he preaching on this again? Yes, I am. Because that's the mission of this church. We're here to help people follow Jesus so they can experience a better life. Now, the first week of Mission 1010, that's where we get Mission 1010. John 10, 10, together with the Great Commission. The first week we talked, we broke this part down and talked about helping people. See, we're in the people business. Ministry would be easy if it wasn't for people. (laughs) But let me tell you something about people. People are messy. Because life's messy. We are in the people business. And there's two types of people on the planet. Those who know Jesus and those who don't know Jesus. And it's our responsibility to reach those who don't know Jesus, but help those who do know Jesus grow in their faith. That's a very tall challenge for most churches and for churches in general, right? Because either they're all about reaching people, but not about growing people. Or they turn inward and they're all about growing people, but they never reach out and get new people. We have been given a mission to go make disciples. It's a continuous move. 
And so if you're a Christian, let me speak to you if you're a Christian, you've been given a ministry and a mission. And your ministry is to serve the body of Christ where you attend. If this is the place that you call home, if this is the place that this is your home church, you have been commanded by God. This is not a Pastor Daniel thing. This, ain't a, this is not a better life statement thing. You have been commanded by God to serve your church and to the minister to the Christians. Where do you think we get love one another, pray for one another, honor one another, encourage one another? They're all towards believers. And if you're here and you're a Christian and you're not serving, listen to me. Let me, let me, let me help you out. If, if you can't get plugged in here, if this is like, nah, this is not where I really fit to serve or whatever. Listen, listen. When you serve, you bring God glory. And we're more concerned about you bringing God, God glory than you sitting in that seat. And so if that's the you and you can't really connect and find a place to serve, you need to, listen, we'll help you. You need to go find you a church and you say, you know what, this is a church I want to give my service to. This is a church I want to serve in. And you go find yourself a church that you can give yourself to serve because when you serve, you bring glory and honor to Christ. And you've been commanded to do that. And so you may need to figure out, like, is this the place that's my home? i got to find a place where I can jump in and serve. And we got many places for you to do that. But secondly, if you're a Christian, you've been given a mission. And that's to those who don't know Jesus. Every single one of you have people in your life right now that don't know Jesus. Who comes to your mind right now? What family member? What classmate, roommate, coach, teammate, sorority sister, fraternity brother? What person at work? God placed you in that place for a reason. And that's for you to get on mission with him and that you use your life to influence them to follow Jesus. Those people that just came to your mind is your mission field. And every Christian has a mission to go after people. What do you want us to do? We were here to help them follow Jesus. And we believe that following Jesus is a series of taking next steps. Maybe your next step is to come back next Sunday. Maybe your next step is to give your life to Jesus. Maybe your next step is to get baptized. Maybe your next step is to join a group. Maybe your next step is to know what, I'm going to jump in life track. See, those are things that happen in here. But maybe for you, maybe your next step is you're praying, God, is that where you want me to move and take that job? God, is that what you want me to major in? Maybe your next step is start getting serious with your relationship and he's going to put a one carat platinum ring on your finger. Can I get a witness, ladies? (laughs) Tell him to step up, right? Maybe that's his next step. Maybe that's your next step. We all have next step when it comes to following Jesus. I don't know exactly what that is for you, but it's our mission to help you figure that out so that you will follow after him. But what I talked about last week, because a lot of people were gone last week because it was cold, it was snowing, and all that stuff, and you may not have been here. But let me tell you something about following Jesus. It will cost you something. Following Jesus is costly. It will cost you something in your life to follow Jesus. And we talked about things. What keeps people from following Jesus? We looked at three guys in the Bible that some things that we saw that kept them from following Jesus. Let me me walk you through that. Here's some things that keeps people from following Jesus with all of a heart, with total abandonment. One is your comfort. You want to be comfortable. I mean, think about it. Come on. Our whole lives, we do everything we can to make ourselves comfortable. Parents, we do this with our kids, right? Every parent says the same thing. I want my kids to have more than I had. I want my kids to be better off than I am. I want my kids, I want to buy my kids more presents than I got more presents. Listen to me, dads. They don't need more of your presents. They need more of your presence in their life. And so we do everything we can. I want to get the right job where I can make enough money. Why? So I can be comfortable. Because we base that in our security. Right? I want the right working environment. I don't want all these people who drown me that have all this bad language and all these non-Christian stuff. I want the most peaceful, comfortable life. Why? Because I want to be comfortable. But let me tell you, following Jesus is not comfortable. And it will cost you something. And maybe the reason why you won't step out and follow Jesus is because really you don't want to get uncomfortable. When it should be more about his calling and commission in our life than my comfort. Here's another reason why we don't follow Jesus. Because I want what I want when I want it. We're selfish, all of us, including your pastor. I want what I want when I want, right? And I want what I want more than I want God's will in my life sometimes, right? Think about it. I'm going to marry who I want to marry. I'm going to date who I want to date. I'm going to take the job that I want to take. I'm going to major in what I want to major in. I'm going I'm I'm to go where I want to go. Why? Because it's all about you. Instead of getting before God and saying, God, I want this, but what's your will? We're more concerned about our want than we are about his will in our life. And then here's the big one that really keeps people from following Jesus. It's your past. You're so fixed on your past. That's why last week we talked about when Jesus says, those who grab a plow and they move forward, they're unfit for the kingdom of God if they look backwards. 
So many of you are stuck in your past, your past failures and your past successes. The reason why some of you won't step out by faith and do something for God is because you were successful in your past and you're afraid of failing. Your success and accolades will hold you back from stepping forward. But for some of you, if you're like me, maybe it's because you have a messed up, jacked up past. And you go, there's no way God could use me. I've messed up. I'm too far gone. I'm too sinful. I'm too dirty. I did things in my life. There's no way God can use me. And you'll look back at your past to keep you from pursuing the destiny that God has for you. And it's not about what's behind you, it's about what's ahead of you. And what is ahead of you? Well, let's look at the rest of our mission statement. Can we put that back up on the screen? Because today we're going to finish the statement. Our mission is to help people, lost people and people who know Jesus, every one of them, follow him. I promise you, if you'll follow Jesus, he'll never lead you astray. He'll never, if you'll stay close to Jesus, you don't have to worry about tomorrow. You don't have to worry about what you're major, who you marry, what you're going to do, where you're going to move, how you're going to be fine. Listen, you don't have to worry about it. You just stay clean and close to Jesus. If you can follow Jesus, then ultimately, here it is, you will experience a better life. What's ahead of you? A better life. A better life. Now, I, what I want to do here is I want to educate. I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I want to unpack what it means What's the better life mean? Because, you know, you're inviting people. You're going to come out on Christmas. You're going to be hanging out with people, and they're going to say, how church are going? Are you going to church now? Yes, I go to Better Life Church. What in the world is that? What is better life? So before I tell you what it is, let me tell you what it's not so that you guys understand exactly what Better Life Church is. So you're going to leave your understanding clearly how we define better life. Let me tell you what it's not. The better life does not mean that you will not have pain. You will have pain. The better life does not mean that you will not suffer, for you will suffer on this planet. Jesus says, when you have trouble, I don't like that verse, y'all. I don't like that verse. He didn't say if you have trouble. He says, when you have trouble, when you have sorrows, when you have pain, when you have suffering. I don't like that part. Take heart, for I have overcome the world. Just because you know Jesus and follow Jesus does not mean that you will not hear those words. I don't love you anymore. I'm leaving. Doesn't make you immune to that. Just because you know Jesus does not make you immune when the doctor looks at you and says you are sick and you have cancer. Just because you know Jesus does not make you immune to any of that. In fact, listen, we will suffer on this planet because this is not our home. And you've got this mentality that life needs to be comfortable and life needs to find security in the things of this world. And and I just need to make sure I'm so safe and secure that I don't have any heartache or pain. You cannot live in a bubble. You will suffer. It costs to follow Jesus. Have you counted the cost? But folks, it's way worth it. It's worth it. The better life doesn't mean that God's your genie in the bottle and he'll give you whatever you want. Right? So many people think the better life is like God's being a genie, like prosper and prosperity and all this stuff. And I probably don't even have to unpack this, explain this, but probably don't even hear this. But so many people say, well, the better life, maybe, maybe they're all about prosperity. And it's all about the prosperity gospel. Do you know what the prosperity gospel is? I'm going to help educate. You. you know what the prosperity gospel, here's what the prosperity gospel theology teaches. That if I know Jesus, I will be healthy and wealthy for the rest of my life. Folks, you can't find that in the Bible. But see, around here, it's not so much the prosperity gospel, it's the poverty gospel. Because you know Jesus, you should live a poor life. I can't find that in the Bible. I believe as Christians, we got to be a healthy balance there. But I believe that God wants to bless his children. When you are faithful, God will bless you. I promise you that. I promise you that. That doesn't mean God is your genie. God said, I'm not going to give you all your wants, but I'll make sure you have all that you need. There's a big difference there. So does God want to bless his children? Absolutely. Should we be faithful? Absolutely. But we'll let God determine what the blessings are. I do believe he wants us to prosper in things, but let him define that for us. We don't get to define that. But the better life, what we mean when we say the better life, here's what we mean when we say that. It's past, it's present, and it's future. No, I'm not playing off Christmas, the ghost of Christmas past here, and the ghost of Christmas present. Oh, that would be great, right? I'm not talking about it. it's past and it's present and its future. So let me unpack this. If you're a Christian, what I'm about to explain to you is yours. Every bit of it. 
if you are not a Christian and you don't even know if you believe, you believe in Jesus intellectually, but you haven't given your heart to Jesus, listen, I am so glad you're here. You keep coming back. You keep coming back here every single week and keep learning more about Jesus. We love to teach you about him. But everything I'm about to share is not yours at all. And as you sit here, I want you to count the cost and see, is it worthy to follow after Jesus? When I talk about past, here's what I mean by past. Look what Romans 8, 1 says. I love the book of Romans 8, chapter 8. is probably my favorite chapter in all the Bible. This is an amazing chapter. Look, look what verse 8, verse 1 says. There is now what? No condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Now, this is amazing. If you have put your faith and trust in Jesus, you know what he says? I forgive you of all your sins in your past, your present, and your future. And now you stand before me. You don't stand before me condemned. You stand before me a free person that I will never punish you. Think about this. I will never be punished for my sins. You're like, Pastor, I never heard that. You know why? Because Jesus took my punishment. Jesus took my place. And therefore, he condemned his son to death so I can stand free in front of him. If that doesn't make you shout, then maybe you need to find another church. That's exciting. Now think about this. I stand before God free. Though my sin was scarlet as red, it's made white as snow. That I stand before God, a free person, never to be condemned of my sin. Folks, listen, if that's all that Jesus does for you, I promise you that makes your life better. It makes your life better. So we talk about the better life. Here's what we mean by that. Here's what we mean is that your sins, all your sins, your past, the sins you will do today after church because you will, and the sins that you'll do this week or tomorrow when you hang out with your family this weekend over Christmas, and you will. Guess what? All of those. All of those. And if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, let me tell you what makes your life better. All your sins are forgiven, and you do not stand condemned before God. The opposite is true for those this morning who don't know Jesus. Right now you stand condemned before God. And God, and God condemns you because of the sin that's in our lives. That's why every Sunday I beg you to give your life to Jesus. And then you get to stand before God holy, righteous, not because you come to church, not because you said a prayer, not because you read your Bible, not because you gave at the year end offering, because Jesus died on the cross for you. That's why you get to stand. That makes your life better. But it's not only past. That's awesome. Man, that's great. Get out of hell. Get to go to heaven. That's amazing. But what about today? It's present. That the better life is actually today as well. I picked a very famous Christmas verse to explain this point. In Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. This is so good. It says, for a child is born to us, a son is given to us. I wish I had time to stay on this and unpack this. This is so much theology right here. It's just so good and juicy that when you're in Bible study, you're like, ah, oh, this is so good. Look what it says. A child is born to us, which speaks of his humanity. That's a perspective from earth. Oh, wow, a child is born to us. But then there's a perspective from heaven. But a son is given to us. That speaks of his divinity. That he is 100% God and he's 100% man. Can you explain that to me, Pastor Daniel? No, because I don't understand it. But the Bible teaches that he was 100% God. He was given to us, born to this world, but he's 100% God as well. That he was given as a son where God gave his very best for you and me. And that's what we're about to celebrate next weekend. You don't want to miss it. All the government was rest on his shoulders. And then here it is. And he will be called. And he will be called. You see, in the Bible days, names were very important. You embody the character of your name. So whatever your name was, that's how you lived your life out. Here is the name or names of Jesus, the one to come. He is wonderful counselor. He's mighty God. He's everlasting father. And he is the prince of peace. You may say, how does that make my life better today? Well, the Bible says that when we repent of our sin and we turn and put our faith and trust in Jesus, guess what? The Holy Spirit of God comes and lives within, within us. Like Jesus comes and lives within us. And that means when I sin or things in my life, he convicts me and he disciplines me. If you right now are willfully sinning against God and there's no conviction in your heart, you have to ask yourself the question, 
is the Holy Spirit even in me? Because when the Holy Spirit comes in your life and you begin to sin, He will correct you, He will discipline you, He will convict you. But because of that, because Jesus is in my life, I get to embody the characteristics of His name, which means He is always with me. Now watch this. No matter what you go through in life, no matter what happens to you today, you know what? You have a wonderful counselor to counsel you. No matter if she walks out on you, no matter if you lose your job, no matter if the doctor says something you don't want to hear, guess what? You have somebody to walk you through this because he's with you. Jesus is with me today. He is my counselor. But it don't stop there. He's my mighty God, which means he is my strength. Folks, there's sometimes days in my life I don't want to get out of bed. You ever had those days? Or sometimes in my life I'm weak, my faith is weak, I'm weak. And in those moments in my weakness, God is strong. And he gives me the strength to go on. He gives me the strength to carry through today. But it don't stop there. It gets gooder. He is everlasting Father, which means he is my hope. If he is everlasting, he is already in tomorrow because he's the beginning and the end. Now watch this. This is amazing. That he is my hope. That no matter what I go through today, I have hope in him tomorrow. Because if I have no hope for tomorrow, I have no power to live today. And now I have his power in my life today to give me hope that tomorrow's going to be a better day. That I get another chance. Every morning I wake up, I thank God that he woke me up. I get another shot at life. Another chance to serve him. And then this is what everyone longs for more than anything else. I know this is peace. The reason is you do what you do is you try to find peace. The reason you work so hard at work to find security, to find something that you would put faith in to bring you peace and comfort. The reason you try so hard in school and so hopeful that maybe you'll get a good job, that there's these things, listen, there's nothing wrong with those things. We should bust our tails and we should do things like, but at the end of the day, you know what people are looking for? Peace. And let me tell you something that money can't buy. And let me tell you something that material things can't do. And let me tell you something that the world will never offer you is hope and peace. And because you are a Christian, you have Jesus with you. That means no matter what I face today, he's my strength, he's my counselor, he's my hope, and he's my peace. That makes my life better, y'all, knowing that he is with me. And then lastly, the better life is future. Now, we all know this, right? This is what we sing about. When the roll is called yonder, we'll be there, Right? This is heaven. This is the better life. This is the place where we get to walk by sight and no longer have to walk by faith. This is the place where we get to see Jesus face to face and worship him and serve him for all eternity. This is the place where there'll be no more tears, no more cancer, no more death, no more heartbreak, no more bad relationships, no more sin. You don't tell me that's going to be a better place? And so as a Christian, this is amazing. I'm forgiven of all my sins. That makes my life better. I get to have Jesus present in my life to go through hell on earth. That makes my life better. And then I have hope that I will see him face to face and get to live forever in a place called heaven for all eternity. That makes my life better. And the author of Hebrews knew this when all these people were tortured, saw in two, beheaded, died for Jesus. What gave them the power to be tortured this way. Well, the author of Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 35 tells us, look what he says. They put their hope, don't miss this. They placed their hope, they, the ones who were suffering, they placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. That's what they fo focus on, was I'm going to have a better place to go from this place that I live right now. And here is the truth. We want every single person to experience a better life. We want your family members, your classmates, the people you work with, even your enemies. We all want them to experience this abundant life, this full life, this better life. And the good news is the better life is available to every single person on the planet. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says this, One man died for everyone. That was Jesus. That puts everyone in the same boat. That Jesus died for everyone. He included everyone in his death because he died for all of our sins. 
that everyone could. That's a condition base. Not everyone will be saved. But he died so everyone could be saved and be included in his life. A resurrection life. A far better life than you could ever live on your own. And Jesus came so you could have this abundant life, that you could have this better life, to be forgiven of your sins, to have him with you in your day, and you get to spend eternity with him in heaven. Folks, that makes your life better. That's what we mean when we say better life. So this this, this Christmas break when you're sitting around and all of a sudden, you know, you're talking to your family and then you tell them you go to Better Life Church and look at you and say, what in the world is Better Life Church? Listen, you you just turn, this girl, you go off of them. You say, let me tell you what the Better Life Church, the Better Life Church is my sins have been forgiven, past, present, future, Jesus with me, I get to be there in heaven. That's what the Better Life is. (laughs) Who put something in Aunt Candy's drink? (laughs) Oh, you got crazy family too. I can hear the ones are laughing, right? That's what the better life is. How do you get it? The only way is through the resurrection. That Jesus died and he got up out of the grave. And if you put your faith and trust in him, he will grant you and give you what I just displayed and shared with you. That's this abundant life. It's a better life. There is no hope, Paul says, without the resurrection. And folks, we live in a hopeless world And it's our mission to bring hope to this hopeless region all around us. And you may be sitting here saying, well, pastor, what can I do? What can I do to be part of this mission 1010? Here's the first thing, and this is the most important thing. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, give your life to him. I beg you to give your life to Jesus. You are the reason why we started this church. You're the reason a decade ago we moved here and that people have sacrificed over and over and over for you to sit in that seat so you would hear the gospel that Jesus loves you, he died for you, and he wants a relationship with you. And if you will give your life to Jesus today, everything I just said is yours. No more, no more condemnation. He will be with you in everything in your life. And you get to spend eternity with him in heaven. I beg you to give your life to Jesus. The second thing, if you're a Christian, I want to encourage you to find your place in ministry. Find a place where you can serve God, that you can serve the body, that you can serve believers. That's your ministry. The third thing is fulfill your mission. All the people around you, God put you there for a reason. God put them there for a reason. I know you go to work and you expect the paycheck and I know you go to to school and you expect the education and that's all great and we should do that stuff but at the end of the day, it's bigger than your education or paycheck, the reason why God placed you there. There's people around you who need Jesus. Don't get so caught up in work and sports and extracurricular activities that you miss the people in front of you that God put there for you so that you can live out Christ's character around them. And then the fourth thing that I'd ask you to do that you could do to participate is to give. That you would give to expand the ministry and mission of this church. Now, if you're new here and you're visiting with us, we're getting ready to take up our year in offering. And we do this every year, so this is nothing new to our, our, our church family. But let me, ask, let me tell you the reason that, that we're giving. We're not giving because we're trying to meet budget. I want you to know this. We've already exceeded budget. And the year's not even over yet. All my financial people and Dave Ramsey people, you should have just clapped right there and said amen and shout joy. That's awesome. But for, okay, all three of you, that's awesome. Great. For the 97% left, they're like, what's a budget? I don't even know what a budget is. Like, oh my gosh, I just swipe and spend, you know? I don't know why I just did that voice. That just came to my mind. That's awesome. But because of your generosity, we've already seen almost 500 people this year alone give their life to Jesus in this place. And folks, you know, everyone's asking you to give right now, and that's awesome. This is the greatest time of the year to give, to help and serve organizations, and, and we do that. And an offering, let me explain that, an offering is above and beyond what you tithe. You know that, right? That's what an offering is. And that's what we're bringing an offering at the end of the year to the Lord. So, Lord, you've blessed us. We're grateful. We're thankful. But we're expecting that 2018 is going to be amazing. We're believing in advance you're going to do great things. 
I mean, my wife and I, we give 15% of our gross income to this church. We've been doing that for over a decade now. And we just say, Lord, we give it all to you because we, but then we give offerings above and beyond how God leads us, whether it's to this, another organization to help people out. That's how God is leading our family. And I'm just here to tell you, and I tell you that because I want you to know you can't outgive him. You cannot outgive him. You cannot. And listen, I'm just asking you, listen to Jesus and do whatever he tells you to do. That's the strategy of Better Life Church. That's how we got to this place. What you see around you was sacrificed because people got before God, said, God, what do you want me to do? They listened to Jesus, and because that, you're sitting here of other people's sacrifice. And so let me tell you what this year in offering goes to, because every year we do something different. I'm really excited about this. This year in offering goes to, first, to expand the ministry. Since we've opened our doors, our church has grown 35% attendance, 35%. We are growing fast. We're going to have to add services. We're going to add certain things. And for that, that stuff costs. And so to expand the ministry, why? We're going to have 2,000 people here next weekend. Y'all know that? And then right on the edge of that, it's Easter. We're going to do five or six services, and over 3,000 people is going to show up and worship. We better be ready. We better be ready. And so because of the growth, we're going to have to add staff. We're going to have to uh, fix our structures and our systems that are in place to, to facilitate that growth. We're going to enhance the area of ministry. We've got some great things we want to show you that's coming. It's amazing. So we want to expand the ministry, but watch this. We want to expand our mission because we're here to help people who know Jesus and who don't know Jesus. And we've got some things in the community that we're planning for 2018. We're going to expand that. We're going to reach out. It's going to be great. I can't wait. We're working through that right now. But let me tell you one of the most exciting things that we're excited about expanding our mission. Do you know that we're reaching more people through that camera every Sunday than we are in here on Sunday morning? We have to take aware of that. People all over the country, I can't believe this. It just blows me away. They came and showed me the different states and different countries all over the world who every Tuesday when the sermon goes up are watching us every single week. That blows me away. Unbelievable. And listen, because of that, we're, we're going to make the investment. It's costly, but it's worth it. And because we're reaching so many more people, and then because of technology, the things that we can reach more people than... See, it's always been bigger than Moorhead. Y'all know that, right? God doesn't say, go get Moorhead. He says, get the world. And we're going after them. And you get to be part of it. It's amazing. And so starting, watch it. Because of today, what we take in today, we're going to use that to go to us every Sunday morning. Every Sunday morning, we're going to be able to make this live online every single Sunday because of your investment. What does that mean? Here's what that means. If you're in a nursing home, if you're shut in, if you're in a detention center or prison, if they will let us in, any place where there's internet access, every Sunday we can bring the gospel to people all over the world every single week because of you. Now I share that because that's what you're giving to. You're giving so that people can experience what you've experienced. And it's a better life. And so I'm just going to ask you, it's what I've always asked you for the last 10 years. Listen to Jesus. Whatever he tells you to do, you be obedient and do it. Now you may come today and you're, you're visiting or you're new or you forgot, like, oh man, I forgot that this is the year and offering day. I didn't know what I was doing today. Listen, most of you, a lot of you, you've already given online. That's the way we give. It's safe. It's secure. I would encourage you to do that. It's very easy to do. Super easy to do. But if you prepared, you're not prepared to give, but you want to be part of this, you can download our app. Give right through our app. It's safe, secure, very easy. You could go home, get online, go to our website. You can give there. Or you can stop by this week, you drop a check in or mail a check, whatever you want to do, however the Lord leads you. That's between you and the Lord. Listen, this ain't between me and you. This is not between you and the church. This is between you and the Lord. Just listen to Him and whatever He tells you to do, you'll be obedient because God's faithful. And He's a good God. So here's what we're going to do. Let's just pray and ask God to move as we begin to give. So if you'll stand on your feet, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you. As our ushers come, let's just pray. God. Thank you so much how you've blessed us. God, we give this offering out of gratitude, saying thank you for a wonderful year. But God, we also give this offering out of expectation that 2018 is going to be the best year ever. So God, we ask you to take the seeds that we plant today, that you would multiply them, that you'll bring the rain, you will walk.
harder than the grove, not only to reach this city, not only to reach this region, but God, to reach this world with the gospel, with the good news. So move in our hearts. As we listen to you, help us to have the courage to be faithful. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Come on, let's worship. Thank you so much for joining us today online. If you were impacted by the message today and you made a decision to start following Jesus, we want to celebrate with you. Click on the I Accepted Jesus tab on our website at betterlife.church salvation. If you're interested in supporting the ministry of Better Life Church, you can give online today at betterlife.church slash give now. Have a great week and we hope to see you again soon.